Hello, and welcome to, today, to today's special presentation by Healthy Connections, Suicide Prevention, Current Issues with Child and Adolescent Anxiety and Depression. Today's keynote presenter is Paula Reimer, who's an assistant professor with Marshall University's Department of Social Work. We'll hear a little bit more about Paula and her background coming up, but first, I want to introduce you to the other voices that you'll be hearing on today's webinar. I'm Shane and Wright, Director of Innovation for Quality Insights, and I'll be emceeing the event. A little later on, Crystal Welch will be facilitating questions and answers from the audience. She's a lead project coordinator with Quality Insights. Today's webinar is being produced by Mitzi Vince, communication specialist also with Quality Insights. Speaking of questions, if you have questions for Paula, you can submit them at any time during today's presentation. You do this by using the Q&A or chat icons in your WebEx player. To access the Q&A icon, you can see it in the lower right-hand corner, and then you can select Q&A from the drop-down menu, type your question in the feature, and hit send. You can also use chat for your questions and open the chat feature by dragging your mouse to the bottom of the screen and clicking on the word chat next to the speech bubble. If this is the first time you've heard of Healthy Connections, we'd like to tell you a little about ourselves. We're a coalition of more than 30 Huntington area agencies working together to help pregnant women, mothers, and their families navigate treatment and support services available in the Huntington, West Virginia area. You heard the name Quality Insights in the introduction as well. If you're not familiar with Quality Insights, we're one of the largest nonprofit organizations devoted to improving healthcare quality in the United States. We use data and community solutions to achieve the goals of better care, smarter spending, and healthier people. We have more than 300 employees and consultants who have experience in healthcare delivery, continuous quality improvement, medical record abstraction, data analysis, and much more. Quality Insights works with Healthy Connections to provide in-kind services to the coalition, including marketing, branding, web infrastructure development, partnership coordination, resource creation, earned media, advertising, and webinar production like today's special presentation. At this time, I'd like to introduce our keynote speaker, Paula Reimer. Paula received her Master's of Social Work with an emphasis in clinical medical social work from the University of Kentucky and is an instructor for the advanced standing clinical practice classes of the Master's of Social Work program at Marshall University. She guides students as they prepare to work with individuals and groups in the underserved areas of mental health and substance use treatment. Her goal is to equip students to be ready to provide integrated behavioral health care services, and her passion and interest is in suicide prevention and bereavement from suicide loss. She desires not only to encourage family members that have lost a loved one to suicide, but also professionals that have lost clients to suicide. Over the years, Paula has been instrumental to bringing awareness to Marshall University's campus by organizing a campus-wide suicide prevention walk for hope. With that, it's my great pleasure to turn today's presentation over to our keynote presenter, Paula Reimer. Thank you, Shannon, so much for that great introduction. And speaking of Walk for Hope, we're having that this evening on campus at 6 p.m. if anyone would like to join us. Um, I wanna thank you all for having me here. That is a real honor. We're gonna look at suicide prevention and current issues with child and adolescent anxiety and depression. And um, as we go through this, feel free to um, submit questions in the uh, chat box. Crystal's gonna monitor those. And um, it's okay, Crystal, for us to um, answer during the session and not have to wait till the very end if it's something that pertains to exactly what we're talking about at the time. 
We have four objectives that I'd like for us to look at, understanding anxiety and depression in children and adolescents. And for a long time, we didn't think that this really existed um, and really was a problem for children. Well, we knew that teens were changing and, and having mood changes and as they develop and, and go through puberty. And, uh, but we didn't really realize the extent of what uh, younger children actually experience. And we're going to kind of look at that and the correlations and how anxiety and depression can lead to suicidal and self-harming behaviors. Um, they are two different types. Um, suicidal behavior is the intent to take um, a, a person's life or, or uh, to die by their own hand. And self-harming behaviors are to inflict pain for different reasons. And we'll look at that and why sometimes children um, and adolescents will do this and what key factors we're finding now that we didn't really realize a few years ago. Uh, creating a fluid change agent that leads to reducing negative behaviors. And, and this is understanding how to transition, uh, care, how to look at you know, what are some of the better interventions that's being uh, used at this time and how to reduce uh, these behaviors as, as quickly as possible. When we understand a, more, a little bit more about anxiety and depression in children and adolescents, we actually are able to treat that or find help or hope for these, these children, these teens. Um, ACES is a kind of a, a big thing that has come about in the last few years, looking at levels of trauma. And, and we know um, that when a child has four more ACEs, they're 13 times more likely to complete suicide. Um, we know that they are 27 times more likely to self-harm. Uh, we look at ACEs as trauma, whether it be emotional, physical, uh, or sexual trauma. Uh, food disparities is a trauma. Uh, living in areas that crime rates are high. Uh, seeing violence daily, whether it's uh, domestic violence in their own home or with other people that they know, living in uncertainty and fear. And so right now we're looking at things such as COVID-19, which we know that a lot of kids have kind of just went along and not really been affected as much as we thought maybe they would be. But then we also have children that's been highly affected, children that their safe haven was school, not home. Uh, their, their place to eat was school, not home. And so we find out that a lot of added anxiety, added worry, added depression in children and adolescents has come about because of COVID-19. We've got to um, learn how to identify factors that sometimes we overlook. And one of the things that I want you to look at is not only trauma to the child or the adolescent, but the people around them experiencing trauma. Um, this past year, we've seen uh, people die by um, COVID-19, which has moved up in the third most uh, leading cause of death, and that was for last year. And that was something that children did not and teens did not have to deal with previously. Uh, that was a new trauma that was added to adults. So we all had some degree of fear and worry that was increased. And so understanding that new things that happen have to be included in the trauma. Substance misuse, we have seen 
so much increase in that in our area. Looking at how to treat substance, how to help people with substance problems. Uh, I remember the um, the first year that I was at Marshall University. Um, actually, the first day I was on campus. We had approximately 26 overdoses in less than two hours. Uh, and so understanding, you know, the impact, the impact of children, you know, whether it be uh, their caregiver or a friend or someone that they know that they love that maybe is not taking care of them at the time. So you've got to be able to correlate these things with what might mitigate uh, increased anxiety, which turns into panic attack, uh, social anxiety, uh, where children do not want to go to school. Uh, they don't want to, uh, you know, many times leave their room. So we've seen that. We've also increased isolation during COVID-19, which is an, uh, when we increase isolation and people are not connected, we see the increase in depression. So um, we see purposelessness, we see hopelessness, withdrawal, uh, reckless behaviors, mood changes. Um, and as I said before, ACEs. We look at substance misuse, uh, who is using, who is around the, the children and the teens that, um, that may have influence. We look at failures in the past. Children worry about school, you know, and worry about the different pieces that um, they really uh, don't understand, you know, like, why am I always in trouble? Um, having undo undiagnosed depression where children cannot, uh, you know, concentrate and focus on their lessons and, and focus on what's going on. Uh, Anxiety creates um, shyness and, and reserve and, and withdrawal where um, they don't join in and, and sometimes they're made fun of because of that. Uh, shame, embarrassment. We see a lot of kids that go to school that, um, you know, um, aren't properly cared for. And um, whether it be in their physical appearance, um, mannerisms, you know, not knowing uh, social cues, being embarrassed. Shame is a big, big factor, and we've overlooked that for a long time in children and teens. And now we're finding that it has a great deal to do with anxiety and with depression. It has a great deal to do with self-harming behaviors such as cutting, burning, um, withholding food from uh, themselves. You know, there's a lot of different self-harmings. Um, with teenagers, it can be risky sex, substance misuse, uh, you know, driving extremely fast, uh, not obeying traffic rules. And um, one thing that I want you to understand, there is a difference in self-harm and suicidal ideation. And self-harm is non-intentional. Non um, you know, it is, they do it with intent to release maybe um, an emotional pain, but it is non-intentional toward taking their life. Suicidal ideation is different, and that is with intent to uh, com complete suicide or to stop living. Now, a lot of teens, especially children, um, they have looked at different pieces um, as, you know, maybe this will get somebody to notice or maybe somebody will help me. It's not just an intention seeker. That's a, that's a little bit different than what I'm talking about here. We're talking about kids really crying out for help, wanting someone to pay attention and to know that they have um, real emotional pain. Okay, 
Now, symptoms of anxiety and depression in youth are, are we're looking at some things that are different than what we'd see with adults. One of the things is um, anger and defiance. You know, we kind of label uh, this as ODD, oppositional defiance disorder, when it's in a teen, you know, they're angry, they're frustrated, maybe they're, you know, maybe tearing up or doing damage or vandalizing, different things. But I will tell you that we have connected this with research, you know, people that have really spent a lot of time researching teen depression have found that these are pieces, these are actually symptoms of a major depressive disorder in teenagers. We look at self-medication, a substance misuse. Teens trying to find a way um, to control the anxiety or the depression or the anger. And so drugs many times, alcohol many times, they will substitute that for actual care whenever they're not really, um, you know, being taken to the doctor or taken to someone that can help them manage this. Uh, withdrawing, um, we, we find a lot of kids with high levels of anxiety have withdrawn into the technology world and substituted technology for, you know, interactions with other people, especially with the anxiety when it's very heightened. Um, triggering events that we have seen most recently, of course, was shut down of schools. Now for many, for many kids, this was um, really tough. This was a negative. But for kids with high levels of anxiety, I, I was working with a kid here not too long ago, and, and he, he just said it was an answered prayer because his misery was being at school. His anxiety was so horrible um, that he, he said it was just an answered prayer not to have to go and talk to people that he could just be in his room and be in a safe space. And uh, he said, because so many times when he would come home after being at school, he was just thoroughly physically and mentally exhausted because his anxiety was so horrific. Now, some of the scales and assessments used to determine these pieces, um, Penn State Worry Questionnaire for Children is only like 14 questions. It's a Likert scale. And really and truly, we see this as a, a good piece of, you know, it, ans it asks questions that for um, children, you know, trying to figure out, trying to help us measure what they worry about, how much time they spend worrying and ruminating over these pieces. So we, uh, this is one particular, um, piece that has an extensive amount of testing and reliability is very, very good. Um, but it's not just asking these questions, but also how you ask these questions. And so if you can help children and teenagers to basically um, tell you their story and how they feel, then I've, um, I've noticed that a much more comprehensive way to actually help them. The RECADS is a revised child anxiety and depression scales, and there's 47 questions on that. And there is also a piece for the caregiver. Um, so that way you can collaborate, uh, you know, what if the child is being fairly accurate. SASCAR is the social anxiety scale for children. There's 22 questions. It's a five point scale and it's, it goes from um, one, not at all, and five is all the time. And then you have in between. And you've got to understand that this helps a child 
child to be able to say, oh, yeah, I do that a lot, or I never do that. And so that helps them to understand that particular pieces to their anxiety, what makes them anxious. Another set of assessment tools that that is used a lot is the PHQA, and that's the Patient Health Questionnaire for Adolescents, and it's for 13 to 18 years old, and it's only nine items, um, very easy to answer, helps them to look at um, how they feel, um, you know, and their physical and emotional and behavioral needs. You know, they also need to hear from the person giving the assessment that they really care about why they feel that particular way. Um, a PHQ-9 is available for adults. And, um, they're, they're very similar. They're easy to score, and uh, they give us some very accurate information. Uh, the short mood and feelings questionnaire is 13 items, and this also will help with the understanding depression. One of the things I want you to understand when you give an assessment for suicide risk, there's only six items on this particular scale. And one of the things that You've not, you've got to be able to ask, have you thought about completing suicide? Have you thought about taking your life? Whichever way that you can say it, please don't ever ask them, you're not thinking about suicide and shaking your head no, because most children and teens want to please and they'll say no, because they know you don't want them to say yes. Um, you've got to be able to say, are, have you thought about suicide? This is not going to plant this seed. Kids that are having these issues and that are positive on this assessment, they have thought about it. You need to know whether they have thought of a plan, how much time they've spent thinking about this, how often they think about suicide, and why would they want to die? What would be achieved if, if they died? And so you've got to ask those questions. Um, scary, very scary. But the more you talk to individuals about this, this releases this internal fear and this grip that these thoughts can actually have on kids. Um, when they're able to release this, I tell many of my clients, you know, this is like a nightmare. Once you talk about this nightmare and you just dissect it, then you may not have this nightmare anymore. So what we want to do is we want to dissect why you feel like taking your life is the option for you. You know, we want to figure out, you know, why you feel that way, why it seems important, and why you uh, are you know, wrestling with this. Let's talk about it. It's it's not as hard as it seems. Um, the impact of COVID-19, and we briefly touched on that, but uh, there was a research piece that was done, a longitudinal research piece that was done in England. And, um, They did four different study groups of kids and teens, and um, they all showed all but one group um, showed extreme fear, anxiety, depression, real concern about social interaction and, and like the lasting effect, you know, is this going to go on forever? Are we ever going to get back to normal? Uh, the extent of the mental health issues is not known at this time. You know, even with 
uh, the fact that they did this study for nine months, uh, it has not really come to fruition what all is going to happen. A lot of kids, the frustration and fear, um, you know, not being able to do what they had previously done, and you know, or, or what you have to do in class. So we've got to understand that there's different levels of anxiety. And at some point in time in childhood, about 10 to 15% of the children experience an anxiety disorder. Now this could be because, you know, just the lessons are too hard or, or the stress of what all they're trying to do at school and, and the, the level of maybe the classes they're taking, but, um, Children with anxiety disorder that goes untreated and, um, you know, not addressed have an increased risk of depressive and anxiety disorders later in life that may follow them all through their adult years. Um, one of the things that I, I want to mention that, you know, in one of my classes, and I'm going to go back to this other slide real quick if I can get it to go. Um, this little girl here in the middle kind of reminds me of what was mentioned in my class. Of course, she looks a little older than five, but uh, one of my students, um, her little girl is five years old, supposed to go to kindergarten this fall, and um, when they were talking about kindergarten and what they were going to do, she said, I don't want to go. I'm afraid. And uh, my student, which was her mommy, said, you know, it, it's going to be okay. And, um, you know, you can go to school. And she said, but everybody, all the mommies will have on mask. And I won't know which mommy is mine. So as simple as that is, uh, it, it may not seem like such a, a big thing, but for someone five years old, that reasoning to me was was very, very prolific. And, and you know, this is real for someone four or five years old in pre-K or kindergarten. So you've got to understand that we have quite a bit of, of issues that we're going to have to work with with our children and help them. Um, if you're interested, um, I think the slides are going to be um, available, but um, the references are in the notes section. And uh, Merrick has manuals um, for mental disorders in children and adolescents that are available for you to use and, and all just all kinds of different helps with that. But um, a lot of diagnosing and, and help, you know, like descriptive pieces are in these manuals, you know, and of course we all know about the DSM-5 and use that as well. Uh, agoraphobia is a persistent fear of being trapped in situations or places without a way to escape easily or without help. And um, treatment is mainly behavioral therapy. And one of the reasons why I wanted to touch on agoraphobia is so many people that I have um, worked with in uh, psychiatric units that have attempted uh, suicide has suffered from um, severe persistent fear of being trapped, being outside the four walls where they feel safe. And anxiety, a few years ago in research, we found that anxiety had actually passed uh, the depression diagnosis as the leading disorder in people that self-harm and uh, in people that attempt suicide. So, but this is what I tell my students a lot. Anxiety and depression are very good traveling buddies. They really like to uh, go places together. And so um, people that have experienced one more than likely experience the other. 
generalized anxiety is just a persistent state of heightened anxiety and apprehension and excessive worry, fear, and dread. You know that something bad is going to happen. And for a lot of people that already experienced this, that was in treatment for this and, and, and being medicated for um, GAD was just in the place where when COVID-19 hit, it increased significantly. And um, so we're, so with students here at Marshall, um, we have a, um, the Garrett Lee Smith grant here at Marshall, and we were able to purchase a well track app that t um, our students could put on their phones uh, that addresses anxiety, depression, you know, using relaxation techniques and just so many other pieces. And we found that that app actually helps. And um, the mood um, check, I see probably six, I can monitor, can't monitor which particular student uses it, but I can see how many times it's been ac accessed. And probably five to 600 times a day, we see the mood disorder or the mood checklist uh, accessed. And the anxiety, um, it's, it's kind of like a little workroom where you have guided imagery and different pieces. And so that is also utilized. Separation anxiety disorder uh, is a very big piece for children, especially when going to school for the first time or being um, left with maybe a new sitter. And so we have, we're seeing that separation anxiety disorder in teens um, needs uh, behavioral therapy as in children. Also family sometimes have to, uh, have to join in in these cases. And for se severe cases, we see SSRIs actually being prescribed. Social anxiety is the persistent fear of embarrassment and ridicule and humiliation in social settings. And typically affected children, they avoid any situation that might provoke this. And so we see this at school, who they sit with, where they go. Um, you know, whether they ever want to join in with some children playing on the playground or whether in teens, middle school is a horrific place for a lot of kids. Sixth, seventh and eighth grade is that time where they're trying to find themselves and, you know, and uh, make their friend group. And so uh, social anxiety is very, very tough for them. One of the things that we look at is different levels of depression, and we have uh, disruptive mood dysregulation disorder, major depression, and persistent depressive disorder, which is dysthymia. It's kind of like a low-grade fever. Um, it's there. It doesn't keep you from doing everything, but you don't really have any joy doing it. Um, so you've got to understand that there's just a, a lot of different pieces to this, and and knowing and understanding uh, what you're looking at. Um, we've kind of went over these and um, one of the things that I want you to look at is temper outbursts are, that are inconsistent with the developmental level. So if you've got a kid that's maybe nine, 10 years old still having these outbursts, you may wanna see, is this irritable, angry mood that's present every day or present five days out of seven? You know, maybe my child is depressed. Maybe my child has anxiety and I, I don't really realize it or maybe that's what's going on with my client. Now, deliberate self-harm is a behavior in which, as I said before, that the act is the purpose of physically harming themselves without any real intent to die. 
we see the most common is cutting or poisoning or overdosing, um, drinking excessively, and um, self-harming sometimes is those risky behaviors. Um, knowing that they don't swim well and, and maybe going to a lake where they don't know the depths of the water, and maybe they jump from the cliffs or whatever. Sometimes um, these risky behaviors may be driving a four-wheeler excessively dangerously and just uh, different things. Uh, putting themselves at risk is deliberate self-harm. Children uh, generally younger, very young, three, four, five, um, will generally scratch, uh, bite themselves. So we see that various conducive factors, such as peers, school, family, religious um, pieces that affect suicidal ideation and self uh, um, derogatory attitudes in adolescence. So we got to look at see what what's really going on here. Why is is it self hate? Is it uh, shame? You know, what, what are these pieces that we're looking at? And we have seen in the past and, you know, I've not mentioned bullying here, but that that is a piece as well. Recent research links the aggravated effects of bullying, including cyberbullying. And so we know for a fact that kids have really spent a lot of time on the internet, on technology in uh, this last year. And uh, the escalation of bullying or the cyberbullying has been has increased a great deal. Self-harm really a way to decrease emotional pain or is it something more? And what I want to talk to you here, and, and you may even want to discuss it. Um, I've seen this um, when I worked in adolescent psychiatric units. We've seen a lot of kids that they'd say, oh, I just cut myself because I feel that makes me feel better. I burn myself because it makes me feel better. But when I got to talk them with these kids, um, we really looked at, is this a practice run trying to uh, gain fearlessness to complete a suicidal act and uh, have an intentional or suicidal behavior. Now, I haven't done the research that I want to do on this particular thing with, with kids that are um, self-harming, but we've got to understand that, um, you know, to self-destruct is, is not hardwired into, into us. We are hardwired to be survivalist. Uh, we've seen that over and over. And so to understand this, we need to look at uh, why they are really and truly self-harming and what is the emotional pain that they're trying to reduce. And is this something such as uh, what I've coined as practice runs at trying to gain fearlessness to complete a, um, a suicidal act? The second leading cause of death for 15 to 19 year olds is suicide. And so we've got to um, take a look at what creates more suicidal behavior, what creates contagion, which is where a not a group of students all at once or a group of children all at once will complete suicide, but maybe over a length of time in a small community or in the same school, you know, is it exposure to a peer suicide? Do they get the grief and loss treatment that they need? And so um, are they imitating suicidal behavior with famous people? 
our media mishandles the deaths of uh, by suicide famous people all the time uh, and it increases the risk factors uh, giving uh, very detailed information on how the person died and kind of idolizing that instead of you know trying to be protective of the individuals listening increased risk risk factors include bullying and internet use um, i don't know how many of you have ever uh, googled how to kill yourself or how to complete suicide but the internet um, gives great detail um, and so so our children can google how to actually take their life um, so i encourage you to you know kind of be very aware what they look at and and what they research history of family mental health issues and a history of family substance misuse issues so there's a lot of pieces that actually can create these behaviors and and connect these behaviors to other things suicide attempts um, within teenagers and and children uh, are one of the greatest risk factors and as i said earlier the development of fearlessness and and from self-harm to the intent to die and discussing what is the attempt about dr stephen o'connor actually did a workshop with my students um, last wednesday and he took several pieces of different research and kind of created what we call um, uh, teachable moments, brief intervention um, that is specific to suicide attempts. And so this is basically looking at how to talk to someone, uh, a child, an adolescent, an adult that has attempted to take their life. And um, you want to always, you know, spend time with that client, not allowing them to just sit and ruminate about the attempt, but, uh, you know, reducing the rumination and getting them to look at how to, how to live, how to change this perspective, how I want to survive. We were fortunate enough at Marshall to have um, Kevin Hines actually um, do a virtual hour with us and uh, about 150 people and um, telling his story about how he lived from jumping from the Golden Gate Bridge. And what we seen with this is he said the moment that his hands left the railing, he knew he had made a mistake. And with teachable moments, brief interventions, we're actually able to, you know, get people to really think about, you know, what is the issue that they were dealing with and what it would take to resolve it. Would it take ending their life? And many, many times the client themselves said, no, it really doesn't have to, you know, be me actually dying to to end this problem or to resolve this issue or to help uh, reduce this emotional pain. So um, I want to look at just attitudes. Um, you know, we've, we've got to learn, you know, what the attitudes are of children and the attitudes of the family that's being impacted if a child is self-harming or has engaged in a suicide attempt. And so we've got to think of ways to um, learn how to communicate different, 
you know, and limit, you know, um, you know, what is, what is our limits in our home? You know, are we able to actually help our child to change their behaviors, their thought patterns? Um, we really need to look at self harming behavior and diminish that uh, with our attitudes at home. You know, whoever the caregiver is, um, there's things that we can do as therapists and, and clinicians that will give them the ability to be able to talk and to cope with these uh, problems with their, with their child or with their teen. Um, is there any questions at this time? Yes, we, uh, I know that you have uh, several slides left, but we, we have several questions in the queue. So, um, however, you want to take it, if you want to finish up your slides, we can um, start with questions or um, however, however you want to handle that. Um, Crystal, do we have any questions that are kind of already what we've already went over and then maybe we can add some of these for reactive avoidance. Sure. Um, we've got some comments and we also have some questions that have rolled in uh, some of the comments. Uh, the 1st comment says, uh, thank you for letting us know it's okay to be direct and ask individuals if they're thinking of ending their life. Uh, there's a comment. Uh, the other comment says, thanks for helping us understand that anger and defiance in youth can be a symptom of depression and anxiety. I will now look for that behavior differently in terms uh, that they might be struggling with a recent event or struggling to process their emotions. Uh, our first question says, can separation anxiety occur when a major figure in a child's life has died suddenly, uh, not a parent? Yes. Yes. Um, and this is um, that grief and loss that that I touched on, you know, that that has to be addressed. Um, because if we don't um, find a way for the child or the teen to process that in a healthy manner, um, it will continue. It's almost like a sore. It will fester and it will get worse. Um, kind of gross, but it is true. <laughs> and this is one of the things that we need to um, actually explore because children are, are very resilient and we know that, but you know, what creates resiliency and that is addressing the issues that they actually are experiencing. So uh, grief groups and going back to the internet, there are online grief groups for kids, teens. I know that hospice agencies do free grief groups. So many times, being able to process that and for them to make meaning out of that loss uh, is a very, very helpful tool and it gives them really good coping skills as they grow uh, once they've processed through. I hope that answers that question. Well, thank you for that. And um, we have several more. I'll just go ahead and, and keep on. Uh, what if someone tells you they plan, they have a plan to take their life? Uh, calling the authorities might escalate things. Um, yes. Is a suicide hotline better to call instead if the person isn't in imminent danger? Um, the 1-800-273-TALK line, uh, that is uh, trained counselors. And so they can talk to them uh, even if they're not to that point, or even if they don't have a plan, uh, there are counselors that can talk to them and help them um, actually find resources in the community that they're at, that they're at. Okay, so say that someone calls from their cell phone, it's going to ping to um, a local crisis line. Is how this works. And so whenever they're able to talk to them, maybe they can say, you know, well, you know, let's talk about this and, and kind of get, um, you know, to the, to the root right now, but let's also talk about who, who we would like for you to see, uh, you know, or who that we can get you into. It's not just, you know, a five minute conversation and they hang up. Um, also, uh, addressing the part about what if they say they do have a plan, then that's whenever you become uh, very vigilant about uh, safety means. Um, there's a website 
um, I've had all my students to take the CALM training, and that's counseling on access to lethal means, and um, everyone should take that. Um, it's how to procure, like, you know, make things safe. It's not an anti-gun website of any kind, okay? It's how to keep people you love safe. And um, so it also talks about different things, not just firearms. So there's a lot of ways um, that individuals can harm themselves. And so it addresses like different ways to actually, um, you know, make your home safer. A lot of people don't realize that, but the most dangerous thing they have in their house is, is a medicine cabinet in their, in their bathroom. And um, a lot of kids can uh, get on the internet and say, how much of this do I need to take and how much of this do I need to take? And they can find those answers pretty easy. So we want to be very vigilant about that as well. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Our next question says, withdrawing from friends, family, and regular activities is a typical warning sign to look for, but with the pandemic and COVID-19, this has been a challenge to connect with others. What is a good response when you hear someone say, I can't do this anymore, or I'm so stressed? Um, I've heard this a lot in the last um, last year, uh, even even early on. A lot of individuals were, you know, I just I don't want the, all these changes. One of the things that I have found is um, sitting and talking. You know, if if it's your family member and the person that lives in your home, you know, you're able to talk with them, but. Um, the telehealth, even though it's through technology, the telehealth uh, counseling is good. These pieces have really been uh, used during this pandemic. Don't always just leave it to guess. You know, have an assessment. Uh, you know, maybe refer your, you know, find someone and, and self-refer yourself, uh, refer your child, uh, you know, call someone and say, you know, I really don't think my child is maybe really depressed, but they're, they're, it's different and I can't really tell because of COVID, you know, and we're not getting to do the connective pieces that we normally get to. Um, now that some of the restraints have lessened, it'll be easier for us to pick up on some of the long lasting pieces of, of COVID. You know, whether this is going to be, like I said, like dysthymia, that's a kind of like a low grade fever. It goes on a long time and it's not detected um, quite as readily as a fever of 103. And so we look at, you know, how this person is changing. And really and truly communication has become our best way, you know, talking, you know, tell me how you're feeling. I was talking to my granddaughter and I was asking her, you know, she's in middle school, which is very tough anyway. And I, I just asked her, I said, you know, how are you coping? You, you all just now getting to go back to school. You've been in school for about four to six weeks, something like that. And, you know, how are, how is everything going? Because some of them go certain days and some don't, and, you know, and it's just such a different, and she said, I, I'm just, I just don't pay any attention. And I said, but, you know, how is it affecting you? I mean, are you sad? Are you glad? Oh, I'm glad to be back in school, but I, it's just, it's just so different. It's just not what it used to be. And so, uh, you know, asking these questions, you know, um, having conversation that's not just how was your day and they say fine and let it go with that. My grandchildren tell me I'm nosy. 
Uh, but, you know, I feel like that that's okay because I'm really interested in their day and what's going on. So don't worry about being nosy. Uh, it might really be a good thing. Thank you. Uh, our next question, uh, we have two more in the queue and then uh, I don't know if you want to just do your last slides or how, how you want to um, okay. handle what, that. Okay, let's, we'll go ahead with the questions. The questions, okay. I'm sure we um, get this answered if we can. Sure, sure, sure. I'll, I'll ask uh, this one and, and then we'll see how long, um, how long we have, if we can do one more. Uh, what do you say to someone who did all the right things and they still lost their loved one to suicide? Well, um, I'm going to be real transparent here. Um, the reason I work in suicide is because I lost my daughter, Allison, um, to suicide when she was a junior in college. She was in therapy. She had a great therapist. Um, she was in uh, group therapy. Um, now, I'll, I didn't do this. This wasn't what I'd done for a living whenever, whenever Allison died. I worked in a lab in a hospital and we thought we were doing all the right things, but yet we still lost her. Other than being able to see in the future, you know, I, I, I don't know, but to be there for people, to care for them, um, really um, the things that I remember most uh, is when people just said, you know, I'm here for you, and they were. Um, they would sit in silence with me when I was unable to talk. They would go with me to parents grief group. You know, they were just understanding. You know, just be, and, and, and if you've lost someone to suicide, be kind to yourself. Don't expect um, for you to get over this. Um, it's tough. You find a new normal, like all of us are, with, um, with COVID, but it is, it is a different form of grief. There's a lot of guilt and shame that goes along with it because we feel like that we have failed our loved one that died. Um, and so there's a lot of mitigating factors that you have to work through. It's a very tough circumstance. But just be there for people that have lost someone. Yes, go ahead, Crystal. Absolutely. Um, and thank you, Paula, for sharing from your heart. Um, that's that's uh, very important. I know that uh, that that's something that you deal with daily. So we really appreciate you being very transparent and candid just now. Um, the last uh, is just a qu it's not a question at all. It's uh, just a comment. Uh, eating disorders seem to be very prevalent um, among adolescent girls. Thanks for clearing up that their compulsive behavior is non-intentional. Um. You know, com compulsive behavior in teens is almost um, to some degree expected <laughs> just because of teens. And I tell my uh, students, um, you know, we have found in the last few years where we used to um, think that the prefrontal cortex was fully developed by age 21, and now we're finding it's 25, 26, 27. And I tell them, you know, that explains a lot of the things that they done when they were in college the first time, because this is an older group that I have now. They're in the master's program, so they're older. But understanding um, impulsive behavior with teenagers, it's almost like you need to expect impulsiveness. Um, so, um, Self-harming behavior sometimes, um, you know, withholding food from um, themselves is, um, there's a different, there's a whole different gamut. This is a whole different plane that we're talking about there. Uh, I did a workshop on suicide and uh, eating disorders and 
because I had to do so much research for that, I really learned a lot. It was it was very interesting, but it was also um, a hard. It's a hard, hard thing to really uh, treat. Um, so that the sooner that you find ways to get an individual help for an eating disorder, the the better. Well, thank you so much, and um, I'll uh, go ahead and join you, and, and uh, just thank you, and uh, thank everyone for joining us today uh, for the webinar. Uh, Paul, if you would just want to give them your contact information um, in case someone has a, an, a quick question offline. Okay. It's Rymer, R-Y-M-E-R, 13, at marshall.edu. Awesome. Well, that wraps up for today. I just want to thank everyone for uh, continuing to support us and to uh, listen to the webinars in the Survival Guide series. Uh, thank you for joining today's presentation of Suicide Prevention, Current Issues with Child and Adolescent Anxiety and Depression. Uh, we thank you for joining and have a great day.